Each speaker is going to speak for 10 minutes, and I would urge you on a topic like this to try and think of questions and comments that you would like to make afterwards, because we're looking forward to a lively discussion um, after each of the speakers has spoken. Um, so without further ado, I will proceed to introduce Claire Fox, um, who, I've, as I've said, is the director of the Institute of Ideas, which she established to create a public space where ideas can be contested without constraint. Claire convenes the Institute of Ideas annual flagship Battle of Ideas Festival, which some of you might be familiar with. The Institute of Ideas has also established the prestigious Debating Matters competition for sixth form students in the UK and India under Claire's direction. She is a panelist on BBC Radio 4's Moral Maze and is regularly invited to comment on developments in culture, education and politics across the whole range of media outlets, which is why you may have heard her name and heard her speak elsewhere. For many years, she taught English in further education colleges in Essex and Hertfordshire. So, thank you. Over to you, Claire. Thanks. Broadly speaking, I'm opposed to the values taking over the curriculum position. But I do appreciate that it's quite hard to argue that schools should be value-free zones. I'm not a moral relativist. And I do think that the values espoused by educators are not a matter of indifference. But I think in the contemporary context, the discussion about moulding citizens um, which is the way the values discussion lies at the moment, is perilously close to propagandizing certain attitudes to young people. And I think we need to be careful that we don't confuse values with contemporary political prejudices. Um, I actually um, am fairly indifferent whether uh, people leave schools as active citizens who routinely vote, uh, or as do-gooders, or as people who never uh, volunteer for anything and decide never to vote. I have little interest, and I don't think teachers should, in what the views are of their pupils in relation to racism or gay rights, or whether they're lovers of junk food or they become Jamie Oliver health food zealots in the future. Of course, I understand that schooling by its very nature embodies certain values, discipline and timekeeping, respect for adult authority and teacher knows best, the respect for a body of knowledge, hard work for rewards, cheating is bad, and so on. But a lot of this is implicit, and this uh, socialization role of, of, of education has actually been something that's been under cover. The main vehicle for uh, moulding the next generation historically has been the transformative nature of education through a body of knowledge being uh, passed on from one generation to another, with an idea that knowledge with a capital K uh, is liberating, powerful, can allow uh, pupils to leave school um, as independent thinkers who can think for themselves. The problem today, as you might have gathered from some of the sessions you've been in, certainly ones I've been at, is, is that we live in a period where educationalists, apart from anything else, are estranged from the notion of the power of ideas, and there's a real sense of ambivalence about the importance of knowledge with a capital K, little faith in the potential for academic education to transform or develop children, and it's suddenly contentious to argue the teacher knows best. In fact, we've already heard that it's a rather outdated uh, uh, and irrelevant uh, idea of having the sage on the stage. I actually wish there were rather more sages in education uh, myself. The main thing is, that the main point is that there's no longer a fully signed up commitment to real subjects um, uh, that represent a real genuine body of knowledge. And in that context of ambivalence, I think it's led to an, a pragmatism about uh, subject uh, content and different subjects and the curriculum itself has become fairly negotiable, even hollowed out, and into that vacuum, any number of non-educational values and their champions can now kind of sidle in uh, and take centre stage. My problem is actually that the school curriculum is being explicitly hijacked at the expense of its core integrity as a vehicle for pushing a variety of politicised values, a messaging service for a variety of interest groups, NGOs, advocacy organisations. In fact, every fashionable cause and fad from multiculturalism to Britishness, from environmentalism to gender equality, from the public health industry uh, to uh, watch uh, training uh, primary school kids about parenting, all has been piled onto the curriculum. And every charity, from Amnesty International to Greenpeace uh, to Cancer Research to Stonewall, uh, are there with their school's uh, programme ready to tell us what the curriculum should be full of. I actually think that real uh, subjects, specific subjects, history, geography, science, we now demand that the core content of those subjects are subordinated to the task of transmitting a, a, a fair amount of contentious political viewpoints, often prejudices, a kind of modern secular crusade of hurrah causes. 
And I think it's quite interesting, and something maybe we would want to uh, discuss, that a lot of my secular colleagues, and I'm, I, I'm an atheist myself, often accuse faith schools of brainwashing people in RE classes. But there's no self-reflection on the propagandizing uh, uh, of, of sustainability or diversity in a range of orthodoxies, which are suitably propagandized to the young. I'm also um, wary that the redefinition of schools as the centers of socialization of values relocates what are social and political problems, and which should be the, the responsibility of politicians, onto the shoulders of teachers. Every policy debate I go to, and I go to lots of them, recently I've been to discussions on drugs, obesity, alcohol, and political apathy. And every conclusion that all of those policymakers and politicians make is that education is the key. And they've got to go ever earlier into the curriculum to change pupils' views. Why? Presumably because children are easier to manipulate than adults. Issues unresolved in adult and public life, it seems, can be simplistically talked about in the classroom. Take the economic crisis. What was one of the key uh, ideas that came out about solving the economic crisis? Financial capability and financial management studies in schools and in primary schools. Let's quote Ed Bulls, 2010. We need to teach children how to, quote, spend with restraint, borrow with insensible limits, and save prudently. And with no sense of irony, he said that. And he then said that lessons in bank accounts, budgeting, and credit cards, mortgages, and loans in primary schools would help us avoid financial problems in the future. What a joke. The lesson of the riots, we are told, uh, proves that we need citizenship education. We're told that the riots taught us that young people want to have their say and be listened to. That's by policymakers arguing for citizenship to be kept. Uh, and it says the removal of citizenship education takes away one of the few ways the state can provide this. And I do think that if that's your understanding of what caused the riots, we're in trouble anyway. I'd like to remind you the riots happened after we'd had lots of citizenship lessons, so it obviously and patently didn't work. And that anyway, um, what are you saying? Oh, that young people are there to, um, to be, have their say, be listened to, and it's a direct route from the state to get to them. In fact, even in relation to voting and political apathy, one of the quotes, one of the politicians is, if we catch children while they are still keen, we might be able to enthuse them. Maybe the 15% average of people who voted in the PCC hadn't been to citizenship lessons, or maybe it was a stupid idea to get people to vote for police constabularies in the, or whatever they were in the first place. I don't even know where they are. I need to go on a course. Right. Um, <laughs> The other problem is, is that I think that often the values taught to young people are explicitly pitted, pitted against the values of their parents. One of the things that most annoys me about the kind of citizenship um, agenda and the values agenda is, is that young people are told, look, the, uh, or in fact, adults discuss how young people's parents are the problem. So you're, there's a Friends of the Earth project, which is really great, which is basically about getting uh, kids to be green monitors in schools. And a lot of schools have signed up for this. And it's basically arguing that they've got to be taught how to recycle, switch off the lights, uh, and, and not use their car as much, and so on and so forth, um, because their parents won't tell them. And if we can get to the kids, they can then go home and tell their parents. Now, if you're a parent rather than a teacher, or maybe both, you will know that we are in danger of bringing up the most hectoring, boring generation of young people known to man. You cannot have a cigarette without somebody tut tutting at you under 10. You cannot fry an egg without being given a lecture on healthy eating. I mean, they are insufferable. A naughty parent seems to be the agenda here, rather than anything else. Alan Johnson uh, uh, made this very explicit when he said, if we can, um, when he was the education minister, if we can instill the next generation in understanding how our actions can mitigate or cause global warming, then we look to a culture change that could quite literally save the world. Children are the recipe to get to the adults. Urging children to tell their parents is a danger. Um, so, uh, final remarks. Another area of uh, values uh, education that I'm very worried about is in, um, this is where we start to cross over with uh, 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 teachers taking over from parents, is the well-being agenda and actually the management of children's emotions. I'm a great opponent of social and emotional aspects of learning, SEAL, I hate it. Um, I think that anything that has the audacity to tell young people what are positive and negative emotions we are in serious danger of. Why is it that teachers think it is appropriate to interfere in the emotional uh, in, uh, minds of their children, not through knowledge, but by lecturing them that, for example, anger is bad. I would like to point out to you a lesson in life. Anger is rational and good and sometimes merited. 
And it is ridiculous to try and sanitize the kind of emotions that children uh, um, um, express. I think it is dangerous that uh, teachers spend so long now worrying about bullying in the sense of trying to create friendship groups, saying that bullying is exclusion from friendship, interfering in the choices that young people are making and their emotional uh, lives, and then telling us it's got something to do with emotional literacy. So ultimately and finally, a curriculum devoted to the total makeover of children's values and emotional lives leaves little energy, leaves little energy or room for dealing with such secondary issues as uh, in, uh, subject knowledge pushed to the sidelines. But I think there's a value in and of itself in the intergenerational passing on of the best that's known and thought. And introducing the young to the scientific method or the greatest works of European culture is worth doing. It's only through the acquisition of knowledge that children can transcend the limits of their experience and gain the intellectual independence to make their way in the world, to develop the moral autonomy that allows them to decide which values matter. And hopefully, when they get there, they'll say citizenship and the teaching of values is a complete waste of time. Thank you very much. Very much, Claire. Um, right, moving swiftly on to our second speaker, Bishop Michael Nazir Ali, who is the 106th Bishop of Rochester for 15 years until September 2009. He is originally from Asia and is the first non white diocesan bishop in Church of England. Michael has been a visiting lecturer in a number of universities and colleges in the UK, Canada, US, and Australia. He's traveled widely in Africa, Asia, Australia, Europe, and North and South America. <laughs> Um, and he's the author of 10 books and numerous articles on mission, ecumen ecumenism, the Anglican communion, and relations with people of other faiths, particularly Islam. Over to you, Mike. Thank you very much. Um, I'm always interested in what people uh, pick out from your CV, so thank you for that. Um, I was watching the, the Festival of Remembrance. Um, was it last week? I think it must have been. And I was very interested to see how people uh, give a pattern to uh, service, to selflessness, to sacrifice. And of course, the pattern that they were giving at this Festival of Remembrance, and indeed uh, services of remembrance up and down the country, was the Christian story. That is how uh, they were making sense of their own story. And so, uh, Contrary, as it were, to uh, what Claire has said, I would say that uh, values are inescapable, that we need values uh, to find uh, a place for our story in the big story. Of course, in this uh, Festival of Remembrance, although the pattern was being made by the Christian story, there was plenty of room for others. I mean, Nick Clegg and Ed Miliband appeared to be quite comfortable even though they're declared atheists, uh, of course. Uh, and so uh, that leads me uh, to my next point, which is that there is no uh, neutral vantage point in this to believe that we can just deliver a body of knowledge uh, without uh, values is, is simply mistaken. And it may be deceptive. It may be that we are simply smuggling in values uh, ourselves. and. Um, uh, I don't think it's possible, but I do believe that values uh, are not simply subjective. They're not simply about our desires and uh, our sort of giving worth uh, to people and to objects. I think uh, other people, well, obviously other people, but also uh, objects and events and processes uh, can have intrinsic value themselves, which we simply recognize. Uh, so that's, that's the next thing. The third is the question of the place of RE. Claire has mentioned this already. The place of RE, citizenship education, uh, personal and social education, and so forth. Uh, I believe it is a mistake uh, to marginalize uh, these subjects in the way they are being marginalized, perhaps for the very propaganda purposes that Claire was talking about. Uh, because this is where, uh, it's not about brainwashing, it, this is where questions about value, indeed of ultimate value, can be discussed and examined and tested and compared. Um, fourthly, I think in the sort of wider plan of education, uh, we cannot evade value. I mean, take the teaching of history. How can you teach history without value? Uh, 
uh, why do we not, for instance, give more attention to the, what Letty called the perfectly virtuous pages of our history? You may say, well, what are they? Well, just to give a few examples, I mean, King Alfred, the way in which the, uh, he produced a common law uh, which has uh, provided for many of the liberties that we take for granted. Uh, now, of course, he took into account the customs uh, of his people, uh, but he also made sure that this common law was congruent, for example, with the Ten Commandments. The Charter of Liberties under Henry I, uh, Anselm was then Archbishop of Canterbury and hugely responsible for making sure that Henry actually uh, adhered to what he had promised. Uh, well, I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> that's another story. Uh, the Magna Carta itself uh, and its uh, promise of liberty for so many people uh, the abolition of slavery first in the 12th century already in this country. Uh, that is when it was first abolished. Uh, and then later on, uh, the struggle against it in the 18th century uh, and the 19th, which was fueled uh, by uh, Christian ideas uh, that the slave was uh, a brother and therefore could not be enslaved. Um, and not just the abolition of slavery, but uh, the active participation of the Royal Navy, for instance, in checking the slave trade off the coast of Africa at great cost to, to itself. Uh, now, when we teach history, we, we should mention these things, as well as all the shortcomings and the, uh, and the darker side uh, of history, as there certainly is. Uh, what about the Constitution? I've been uh, writing about the coronation service. Now, don't worry, I mean, there's no... <laughs> impending coronation <laughs> service, but somebody asked me to write about it. And uh, the coronation service is full of values and beliefs that the British people, the British state, promises to uphold. Now, you may want to change that, but you know, that's another story. Uh, the teaching of law, I mean, how do we uh, examine the way in which in the course of history, divine law, natural law, human law, human positive law, have come together to create a society concerned for justice, uh, for example. Um, whatever conclusion we come to, we can't free it of value. Um, even the teaching of science uh, depends on a particular worldview of uh, a, a universe that is predictable, where there are uh, laws uh, which the universe follows, which can be examined, and so there can be verification and falsification and all of those things that scientists uh, are used to. Uh, I had a very distinguished friend, Sir Joseph Needham, who was a great expert on China. And he said that at the beginning of the modern era, China was uh, far in advance, of course, of the West uh, in many different ways. So why did the scientific and technological revolution take place in the West? And he said it was because of a worldview of an ordered universe uh, which followed uh, particular laws. And China, of course, these days is very interested in this. Now, um, so uh, we, we do need to look at uh, value in subjects as diverse as history and science. Finally, uh, Klaus Schor, the uh, founder of the World Economic Forum, that's not from them, is it? They gave me one like that. Uh, <clears throat> The founder of the World Economic Forum uh, said to me recently something about the poverty, the poverty of what he called intergenerational communication. Well, he talks like that. But um, the poverty of intergenerational communication, he said that the reason that Europe, uh, apart from Germany, was not competitive vis-a-vis -vis other blocs and other nations uh, was because there was a, a lack of uh, intergenerational communication. And he, he has identified two areas. I think we might want to add a third here. Uh, one is uh, the, uh, the way in which uh, communication uh, has been affected in the family, perhaps because a parent is not there or because the parents are too busy uh, outside the home or because the children are not there. Um, it's broken down in the family anyway. Uh, secondly, he said, uh, it used to be transmitted in the faith communities. And more and more young people, of course, don't belong to any faith community, so it's not transmitted there. 
And thirdly, I think we may say also, uh, what about the school? I mean, the school must be an important uh, place for the transmission uh, of uh, worldviews and values that will sustain people uh, in, their, in their future life. Well, in their present life as well as their future life. So I do believe that the imparting of values in the right way is absolutely central to the work of education. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bishop Michael. Um, moving now on to Wes Streeting, who is head of education at Stonewall, leading its flagship Education for All campaign to challenge homophobia and celebrate difference in Britain's schools, colleges, and universities. Wes joined Stonewall in June 2012, having previously served as chief executive of the Helena Kennedy Foundation, which supports disadvantaged further, ed further education college leavers to access higher education. He's a member of the Higher Education Funding Council for England's Widening Access and Participation Strategic Advisory Committee. Wes is a former president of the National Union of Students and previously served on the boards of UCAS, the Higher Education Academy, and the Office of the Independent Adjudicator for Higher Education. There's quite some titles in that, in that one. Um, so over to you, Wes. Thank you. Um, thanks very much. And um, I think the Higher Education Funding Council for England Strategic Advisory Committee on Widening Access and Participation deserves a clap. You can get through that without <laughs> having to look again at your notes. So, um, so well, well done. Um, as I was thinking about this debate, I, I thought back to um, uh, sort of my, my own schooling and um, sort of back then at secondary school, This Is My Truth, Tell Me Yours was the subject of a fantastic album by the Manic Street Preachers. Um, but I've since discovered um, it's also a famous quotation from Nye Bevan. And I think um, really that, that, that sense lies at the heart of this debate because um, values are subjective. Um, the way we would like values to be addressed within the curriculum or not is highly subjective. Um, as, as Bishop Nazir Ali said, I think it's, it's, it's really, I think it's, it's, it's almost impossible to separate a sense of values from the curriculum or the discussion of, 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 of the curriculum. So what I would argue today is that, is that um, rather than um, seeking to impart values, um, the, the way in which we strengthen our education system and the opportunities of the young people and, and adults that are going through the education system, um, is to ensure that those values are up for debate and a rigorous debate and discussion. Education should fun fundamentally provide a framework uh, for young people to discover the world for themselves, to think about their place within it, and also to decide um, how they want that world to be and what role they want to play in shaping it, if any role at all. Um, I actually agree with a lot of, of what Claire says in terms of her critique of the education system. I think we're far too much concerned with certification uh, rather than education, and I think that that operates at every level of the education system. It's only made worse by um, the commodification of further and higher education and the introduction of tuition fees, where um, one university I'm speaking at before Christmas has a whole um, workshop dedicated to the, the um, theme. They've paid their money, now what are they going to get for it? And I, I think that's um, very sad indeed, because that's not fundamentally what the education system is about. Yes, it's about um, equipping people for life, and an important part of life in terms of success and achievement is getting a job. But I think if we see education purely in those utilitarian terms, then I think um, we actually reduce its value um, and we, we lessen our work as individuals and as a society as well. Um, but I think what lies at the heart of this debate and the reason why it's so often contentious is that people fear morality in the classroom because they fear um, that um, very, sometimes very thin line um, between education and indoctrination crossing over from one to the other. I think people are comfortable with the idea of education. What they're not happy to think about is that schools are places for um, indoctrination. That's something that, that, that I feel very strongly about. Um, the question is, who decides what is and, or, or, and what isn't relevant? Um, and I just think that there are a couple of examples from history. You know, um, Bishop Michael talked about um, the role of the church in tackling slavery, yet um, even within the Christian faith, the Bible was used by a great many people over a great many years to justify slavery. So even within um, a set of values, a set of Christian values, there are ideas and issues up for, up for debate. Um, if we think about the teaching of the Hiroshima bombings, for example, um, it's not simply a case of saying this is what happened in the Second World War. This was a decision taken by the United States of America, and here were the consequences. A fundamental part of the history curriculum and the teaching of that subject is, was it right to drop the bomb? Um, what were the factors that were up to debate? How would you have responded? And those are fundamentally moral questions that are about values. 
and where I think education becomes quite exciting because it confronts people with the hard realities of life, which is there are difficult choices, and you have to make decisions about you know, what, what, what you see as your values and how you um, approach an, an idea um, or an issue. Um, another good example, and a very contemporary um, example, is the debate about equal marriage and whether we should allow same-sex marriage in Britain. Um, I don't believe that schools should be able to teach um, that same-sex marriages um, are fundamentally wrong and tell people that's what they should believe. But by the same token, I don't believe that um, schools should be telling young people that same-sex marriage is right either. Um, I think a really exciting, um, not necessarily even a lesson, but you know, a form period debate or discussion or an extracurricular debate is, is having the discussion about whether we think um, same-sex marriage is right or wrong because I think in doing so, um, it's, it's not about trying to kind of shoehorn the wider world in, into schools as such. It's more about developing critical thinking and, and, and preparing um, young people to be the kind of citizens they want to be. And I, I think that, that can only be um, a good thing. So I think um, the role of schools really is, is to ensure that those values are, are up for debate um, and, and to do so in a way that's safe. And by safe, I don't mean... Um, that we sanitise education. I think that's, that's the word that Claire used, and I think she's absolutely right. When it comes to debating and discussing ideas and bodies of knowledge and, and what we think about them, um, we shouldn't be too concerned with safety. We should be a, a, allow pupils to, to debate and to inquire and to, and to kind of poke around and, and to have you know, really robust arguments. I think that makes um, education more rich and it gives um, people more, um, more from it as a result. Um, but I think... Claire mentioned anti-bullying campaigns. Schools have a responsibility to ensure that people can have that unsafe debate in a safe environment. Um, and, you know, wh when I see the consequences of bullying from the point of view of Stonewall, um, it has um, quite literally harmful effects. It's often said that sticks and stones break bones, but names never hurt. Um, you know, I, I think... Um, I think when you look at some of the consequences of, of homophobic bullying specifically, but it's true of wider bullying, which is the area that I know, um, as you'd expect, um, particularly well, um, there is good evidence, and in fact a piece of research published by the University of Cambridge in July this year shows that if you have an environment um, where bullying is tolerated, whether it's name-calling, physical abuse, cyberbullying, then attendance suffers because people just want to skip certain classes or skip school altogether. Attainment suffers because people can't concentrate on their work, don't feel they can contribute in class, um, and even education destinations change. Um, one of the startling findings of, of the research um, that, that Cambridge undertook um, for us was that um, about a third of, of young um, lesbian, gay, and bisexual people changed their education choices and destinations um, as a direct result of, of homophobic bullying. And then there are the really severe consequences as well, like um, the 55% of lesbian, gay, and bisexual young people who self-harm either by deliberately um, cutting or burning themselves. 55%, that's more than half um, of, of, of young gay people in schools. I think that should be a serious cause of concern, as should the one in four who attempt suicide. And, you know, when you put those statistics alongside the, the wider um, statistics around suicide and self-harm amongst young people generally, I think there's something of a crisis there. Um, and we have a responsibility to, um, to, to, to intervene, to ensure that schools are a place where everyone can be, them, be, be themselves and to, and, to, and to learn in a way that is safe, even if they're, ex even if they're experimenting and debating sometimes some quite dangerous um, ideas. The final thing I would say, um, picking up on what Claire said, is that, yes, increasingly people do look to the education system um, as a silver bullet, um, on a whole range of issues. That's probably because um, education is the closest thing we do have to a silver bullet, whether it's narrowing um, social disadvantage or, 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 in fact, and I think more fundamentally, trying to get a group of people who are fundamentally um, and detrimentally being affected by decisions being taken by people far older who won't live to see the consequences. I think that's really, you know, I, I think there's something good about the politicisation we've seen of young people, whether it's you know, the young people that walked out during the war in Iraq, um, or it's the, um, the young people that marched on the streets of London because their education maintenance allowance was being taken away and their tuition fees were being trebled. And the prospects of, of a good job and a good, a good home and a, and, a, and a good life are diminishing um, because a generation that had it good um, are paying less care and attention than they should to a generation that's going to inherit um, a far less safe, um, healthy, happy and sustainable world. <laughs> 
And I think those sorts of issues should be up for debate in schools. I think that's a fundamentally a good thing. That's fundamentally what education is about. If it was simply about transmitting a body of knowledge, um, then we'd be, we'd be in school for our entire lives and we still wouldn't get around to learning everything. It's not about that. It's about helping people chart their course through life, find out what it is that they care about, what they value, what they want to know more about, and what they want to do with their lives. That's fundamentally what the education system is about, and you can't separate values from that process. You just need to make sure they're up for debate. Thank you very much, all three of you. I'm sure that there are plenty of questions going on. I see hands already. But just before I go to the audience, we do have a good half an hour. So I'm going to claim a um, chair's privilege just for one question. And it's going to be the same question to the whole panel. Um, that if we accept the premise, and I know that some might accept it more than others, that schools, let's leave aside the curriculum just for a second, that schools are spaces in which values could be profitably debated and that young people's ability to chart their own, I think you called it a um, moral um, independence or critical thinking um, within those spaces. Who else might be involved in that debate? Should it just be a dialogue between teachers and their students or should there be other constituencies involved in a dialogue about values using schools as a space? I'm thinking whether it be national politicians having their say, whether it be universities being involved, whether it be businesses, whether it be parents. Do you think that there were a scope for a wider debate? Claire, I'll go to you first. I, I think that, um, um, the, Bishop, you made a very interesting point about the traditional methods of socialization we've lost faith in. So people consider, for example, that the family is no longer to be trusted. And often what happens is people will say, oh, well, we used to be able to rely on families to pass over these values, but now we can't because they're all in a mess. I think that's rather insulting to parents, but that's considered to be the case. Or we used to be able to rely on churches, but you know, church attendance isn't what it was, as it were, and the church in the life of the, the world doesn't exist. So I, I think that there is a danger of going to, you know, everybody looking to schools. And the reason I say that is because I actually think at the moment the schools are full of external agencies going in preaching values, and I think that's, there's too much of that, if anything. Um, I think that the, um, the, the, the difficulty I've got with this is, is that, of course, and I wasn't trying to argue, um, of course the curriculum in and of itself embodies values. Decisions are made about what's canonical, decisions are made about what's relevant and what's pertinent, and I understand that. Um, but the contemporary discussion about values is a more explicit discussion that's much more opportunistic. So what happens is, is that you'll say, oh, there's riots. Oh, what can we do with the curriculum to resolve it? There's obesity. Oh, quick, grab the science curriculum. There's a growth of uh, social, yeah, racism. Oh, well, let's um, make sure that we're teaching the problems of slavery. And this is actually, uh, is value light, it's morally illiterate. I mean, it's, it's kind of like posturing. It's not values. And so, and it's not mor morality. And so my, my fear is that then what you do to compensate, because you're not quite sure what to do, is you then think, well, bring the experts in. But they're people that have got political opinions. I've got, I'm fine with that. I want more people going and lecturing in schools, but not as part of the curriculum. That's different. Having external speakers from all over the place, brilliant. But not because you, they can compensate somehow at introducing values. That's the wrong way around. Yes, I think education is far too important to be left uh, to schools and to educationists. I mean, there must be a wider dialogue. And um, families clearly must be involved. I mean, parents must have the primary responsibility uh, for their children. The state cannot simply replace parents. I mean, whenever that has been done, it has been done in a totalitarian yeah. context. I mean, the Soviet exactly. Union is clearly an example of Mao Zedong's uh, China. Many other examples can be given. This is very undesirable. So the family, uh, parents, must be in the dialogue. Um, a third of the schools in this uh, country um, have something to do with the churches. So obviously, you know, I would say that wouldn't I? Uh, the churches have to be uh, partners in the dialogue, but I hope responsible partners. I mean, not in the sense of indoctrination, but of genuine education 
Uh, however, I mean, I have to say that it is not in the last 50 years or so, it is not the churches that have been principally guilty of indoctrination, uh, but those people uh, who would rather that Britain forgot uh, those perfectly virtuous pages of its history. And so this overriding sense of guilt has been induced, which we must get beyond. Thank you very much. And Wes? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, we, we do stuff with schools, and I think that's, that's fantastic. And, and, you know, it's partly about kind of training and supporting teachers to um, identify and respond to homophobic bullying when they see it, part, not least because significant proportions of the profession were going through teacher training um, or, or had already been um, trained during the years of Section 28 when um, essentially discussions of gay people generally were, were banned. And that, that was really harmful because um, all it does is, is, is limit um, children's ability to live life in the late 20th, now 21st century where, you know, gay people are a fact of life. We exist. It'd be, you know, it's a bit ridiculous to airbrush us out of, um, out of existence in a, in a way that Section 28 did. But um, I just pick up Claire's point on the curriculum because I think that there aren't, you know, the, the examples I would give around areas where I would like to see the curriculum change or we, we provide advice around the curriculum. I think, like, you know, sex and relationships education, I mean, A, I think it's taught pretty badly generally anyway. And um, I remember, um, I hope you won't mind me saying this, my form teacher seemed to go off sick once a day for about three weeks in a row until the school finally conceded he was not going to stand in front of the room while we put condoms on bananas. And, and you know, um, I, and that's, that's, you know, that's, I think, one of the problems with, SR, with SRE. But um, at the same time, you know, there will be pupils in that classroom who um, will at some point have sex or be in a same-sex relationship. And it's really important that they receive good sex and relationships education as well. Otherwise, again, the consequences further down the line are really harmful. Um, I think there are worthy debates around um, ethics and religious education. And there's a great film at the moment called Call Me Could You, where, um, which, which um, shows the um, Ugandan gay rights activist David Cato and his story, which ultimately resulted um, in his murder in Uganda. Um, and an, an interesting component of that film um, is the prevalence of um, evangelical preachers going over from America to fuel um, the debate in Uganda, which has resulted in laws being brought before you, the Ugandan parliament um, to criminalize um, homosexuals. And I think there's a really interesting debate there, not, not about re just religious, religion and ethics, but about imperialism and the extent to which cultural imperialism is still alive and kicking in the, in the 20th century. And those are interesting debates. So, uh, it's not, uh, you know, from Stonewall's point of view, it's not about kind of pushing a political um, uh, but, agenda. I think it's just about ensuring that, you know, but, our existence is acknowledged and, and that, you know, we're having, you know, and that actually young gay people are being serviced just as well as everyone else. I think that's... Um, really valuable and I think what that really highlights is that there are issues that I don't think anyone would argue are important and really 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 crucial I suppose my question is I base the question of this debate really the fact that it says even curriculum rather than education is where is that most appropriate place and I think but one, I just want to just throw one challenge out you see the, I think the only bit where I feel that we're being disingenuous is that we're sort of sitting here saying oh value is very important all the rest of it right external agencies should go in right should the BNP be able to go in, uh, you know, or are you going to invite them into every class? Now, you say, everybody goes, oh, don't be ridiculous. Right? They are a legal party, right? Should uh, um, a Christian voice organization that argues that, that uh, uh, homosexuality is immoral and wrong, should they go in and speak in schools? Now, the reason I'm raising that is because I think we all, there's a consensus about the kind of orthodox values we all think we mean. And you can just see... Now, what it is, is there's the right-on agenda that is like, oh, well, that's okay, we can have all those people in. And that's what I mean about a kind of assumed set of values I think actually I think is indoctrination I think to a sinister. Very briefly, just a very brief just response well, very quickly, to that. Very quickly, and then we need to go to the point is, we, we, we have a democratic debate about what is and isn't accepted on the curriculum. And the second thing I'd just say very briefly is that when some of that propaganda um, from um, quite um, evangelical Christian organizations was going into schools, Stonewall's position wasn't the material shouldn't be going in. It was that that needs to be balanced against other arguments so that children are exposed to arguments and can debate them. And I think that's... Th that's thanks very much. And I think that's about the nature 
nature of the space rather than what populates that space. I yeah. think that's, that's, that's the, um, the crucial distinction. Thank you very much for that. I'm sure um, for those of you that uh, have just come in, this is debate on whether we should use uh, the curriculum to impart values. Um, we're about to go to the audience for questions. So I'm going to take three at a time. If you'd like them to go to a particular uh, panel member, then please say. Otherwise, um, they will be able to choose which questions they answer. Um, so three at a time. We've got... The session, for those who've just come in as well, is going to overrun by 10 minutes, as is the rest of the festival, so you won't miss anything, um, so don't get anxious 10 minutes before the end. Um, lady at the back there, and then this gentleman here, and then this gen lady on the left here. That's one. I think there's a roving mic, so if you could just wait for it to arrive with you. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, I should preface this with, I'm not a teacher, I'm a philosophy PhD student. And I'm involved with a project called the Brilliant Club, which means I go... Can you speak closer? Yes. Closer. So I'm involved with a project called the Brilliant Club that goes into schools. And so I, I talk to 10-year-olds about what is fairness. And we... So I was worried that the first part of this debate was couched in terms of um, imparting or teaching values. 10-year-olds have a really strong sense about what is fair and what is not fair. And... They don't need external agencies going in and saying, oh, well, you could think this, you could think this. They just need someone to have a debate with and, and with each other, someone to um, mediate that debate and ask them why they think that. Um, and I think there really, there really has to be a place for that in education. And I just wanted to share a quote with you um, about... This was a boy called Hamza, and he's age 10. And yesterday he said to me, oh, the Brilliant Club is more important than I thought it would be. And I said, oh, why? Um, and he said, because it makes you think about how you should live. And that there has to be a place for that in education, right? Thank you very much. So your, your point being that, uh, partly that children have values already, whether we teach them to them or not. Yeah, I think. Gentleman here, thank you. Sorry, this gentleman at the fourth row here. Fourth, I'd just like to put to the panel, um, you all have made very good contributions. Uh, however, I think you are the panel. You are partly our representatives of education because you can lobby people better than I can. And the question to all for the panel to think about is that how can we change governments the way they are trying to institutionalize education uh, colleges, schools, universities, etc. I think if we start rolling the ball from there, I think perhaps we can do better. You know, if the four of you come to a sort of an agreement as to what it should be done, uh, then I'm quite sure that if you put the debate up to us you know, on a national television basis, then we can develop from there. So I would like to know what the panel's views will be on that. Is that so on, on um, governance of education? And the lady here at the front, second row. Thank you. Um, I was really comforted um, that um, when you were talking about values, um, that you, your talk was steeped in subject knowledge and that values come out of subject knowledge. And you were talking about Alfred. And obviously, Alfred has never talked about whether we should have chocolate bars in our packed lunch boxes, um, which is where we get onto the technical situation with food and seal and all the other things that come into school. But the thing that really struck me was you, you were saying, you know, is this the place for these discussions? Is this the space that we should have these discussions? And um, I went to a course yesterday on outside learning. I went as a teacher to find out some practical ideas about outside learning. And I was told by one of the people who was running it, or we were all told, that children spend far too much time in front of the television. They develop in different size farms because they're on the internet all the time, da 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 and that they're suffering from nature deficit disorder, which that really offended me that he even came up with that term. Um, and then we got to the end of this discussion, and um, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name, but the guy's representing education in Stonewall. You started lobbying us on the situation that um, gay children find themselves in. And this is what concerns me, because you made the point that um, the discussion about the curriculum is outside the school, but what seems to be going on is that people are lobbying schools. So the discussion isn't actually going on outside the school. The discussion seem, the political discussion seems to be going on in school. And you, we as schools are put under pressure 
by lobbyists to introduce things into our, um, our curriculum. Thanks. Do you think that's true? <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, okay, we'll take those three questions. Children um, and their values that they have that they seek to discuss and we should be facilitating that, um, that governance of education and rep I think the question about representation as well to an extent and um, lobbying of schools and what perhaps a pr an appropriate form of that interaction between schools and the outside world might actually look like. Uh, Could I? Yeah, please. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think of what behind this question, you know, uh, this is why I said at the beginning that uh, values are not simply subjective. There is a moral order that is inherent in the universe and in human society. And what uh, children are doing, like everyone else, in their moral development is learning about how they are to respond to this moral order. I mean, in human society, you may say, for instance, that uh, a leading aspect of, of human society uh, is that of justice. So if, if it is that, then uh, children naturally uh, begin to orientate themselves toward this value in the moral order. I mean, it is not just you know, you have your truth and I have mine kind of thing, with all due respect to Nye Bevan. Uh, secondly, I think um, the, the, the question we haven't touched on explicitly anyway today is that of the freedom of speech, of expression, of belief. I think this is very important for children to understand. And this will mean, of course, that they will have to be exposed appropriately, I hope, uh, in schools to people with different points of view uh, so they can make up their minds about particular moral issues uh, in society. Uh, but the schools uh, must have control about how this happens. And I think this kind of lobbying, whether it is by extremist evangelical groups uh, from America or other religious groups or indeed um, uh, particular issue lobbying groups, um, Schools must not be put under pressure simply to, to kowtow to them. Um, okay, um, thank you. I've uh, just been told we're, we're wrapping this up a little bit sooner than I thought, but um, thank you very much for that. I think that actually points to a really interesting question about values and the extent to which uh, they're considered to be subjective in a pluralistic society and then for the question of whose values come through. Um, is a genuine question, and that sense that there is actually a, a universal value system that we all share, and whether or not that's true, and whether or not that should be something in education, I think that's a really useful distinction. Claire. Well, well that's, that raises an interesting question. When they, the first discussion came in about bringing in citizenship education, and in fact what the content of PSHE should be as well, this has also come up, um, what was really fascinating was I, I, I was uh, worried about citizenship, so I kept going to conferences, and I'd say to people from, educate, from the education establishment, what values are you interested in pushing? And everybody went quiet. I mean, we haven't resolved outside of school what the values are that we believe. I mean, that, for me, that's a crisis. Uh, we have actually uh, are value-free in many areas of life. And I actually think that trying to resolve it through schools is rather dangerous when you can't resolve it in adult society. So that's one thing. The second thing, I, I actually thought it was interesting, the question about going in and talking to kids about fairness. And what I'm trying to say is, right, what is a school for? See, you might not need to have to tell kids about fairness, and we can all say fairness, uh, we believe in fairness. But what I tell you what we do need to tell kids about is the periodic table. George Eliot. I mean, who would know that you should read Middlemarch unless a teacher mentioned it to you at some point? Saying to a 10-year-old, do you think life's fair, fairness, or oh, should be fair? I mean, God, we're wasting so much time. What is Whig history? I mean, I hardly need to tell you. So for 2000, thousands of years, we've accumulated the greatest insights of humanity. We've organized them into subjects. We've organized them into disciplines, right? And there we have an opportunity as teachers from the ages of, uh, uh, of, of three, four, five, to 16, maybe to 18, to impart to them some of these great insights. That's it. Bloody hell, that's a big enough task. The idea that you're all wandering around trying to implement an, a, 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 you know, every contemporary faddish you know, value at the same time. Teach kids 
what we know. As much as you know, get them to know. And at some point, they'll grow up and they'll be able to work out their values. Now, the very, the very act of having the confidence to transmit that is valuable and a value, and I appreciate that I'm making a statement of hierarchy. I think that is far more important than rambling on about fairness, the state of the planet, or any of the other fashionable causes of our day. Thanks very much, Claire. I'm just going to let... Wes have one final comment and then we'll invite well, you to come I did on like the, the, the idea that was floated that the four of us should sort out the education system and decide <laughs> what's in it. I'm not sure everyone else would agree. Um, but the, I, I just want to um, really just address the point about schools being put under pressure um, um, in terms of the, of the curriculum. You know, if, if schools feel under pressure because we're saying that, um, you know, in Stonewall that homophobic bullying is wrong and has harmful consequences in terms of attainment, attendance, um, and, and you know, and health and, and well-being. Um, I, I don't see why, why you know, why, why that would be a pressure. In fact, you know, given that schools are expected um, to ensure that bullying is tackled and everyone can study in, in a safe environment, I think the fact that we help teachers to, um, you know, in terms of helping them to have the tools and sharing policies and that kind of thing to help them address it, I think is is fundamentally a good thing. I think the question should be, um, why are so many pupils and not just young lesbian, gay, and bisexual pupils, because why, lots of other people are, are subjected to homophobic bullying, and even if they're not gay, um, they're still called gay. Um, and, and, you know, I think the, the fundamental question should be, why are so many of those people being failed? Because schools are failing to um, act, because teachers who witness the bullying um, in too many cases are failing to intervene. And I think it's those sorts of issues. Uh, and also just the, air, as I, as I said, the airbrushing out of the um, of, of, of the curriculum, any mention or acknowledgement of gay people for yeah. a great yeah. period of time in this country. I think Thanks very those much. are the sorts of things we're trying to address. I don't see that as pressure. I don't see why schools would feel under pressure. Thanks very much, Wes. We're out of time. But <laughs>